All right. Hello, good friend. Good to see you here. Welcome. Tuesday evening, Truth and Justice Vigil. Um, I think mostly, well, almost all familiar faces that have been here before. Ali, good to see you here. Uh, we've been gathering on Tuesday since the onset of the trial for um, Derek Chauvin, who was charged convicted sentence for the death, the murder of George Floyd. And hearing from wise friends and teachers uh, from across lineages, across the US. And we are fortunate this evening to have Tuari Salah returning to talk with us. Tuari is the guiding teacher at Seattle Insight Meditation Center. Uh, I'm super excited. Um, <laughs> Tawari's practice of very much centers in mudita, love, joy, how to get joy. She calls it borrowing joy from other people. And so when she said, why don't we talk about anger? I was like, oh, why don't we? <laughs> why don't we? We all, uh, many of us have this conditioning about how it gets expressed, whether it gets expressed. Uh, and un unraveling that is no small matter, especially when we start talking about race. Uh, yeah, so with that, mm -hmm. I welcome to where is the Good to have you here, my friend. Good. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I love this group. I love that you're doing it uh, and that you've been keeping up with it, you know, no matter what happens and, you know, that it's a drop in. I just love the whole process of it. So um, I figure we'd have a sit for. 30 minutes and then a talk for 30 minutes and then we'll have some question and answers. And um, yeah, I don't think I would have had any mudita had it not been for coming to terms with anger. So when I came to terms with it, I think that's what opened up the possibility for great joy. So that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit. And so I, my granddaughter is going to be with me until her father comes. So we're going to start our set so I have time to go and help her out. But I thought I'd read a poem. I'm going to read it at the beginning of the set. And then I'll read it at the end. Um, it's not a poem. It's actually a quote from David White, who's a poet. But I think what he says about anger is poignant. He says, anger is the deepest form of compassion for another, for the world, for the self, for a life, for the body, for a family, and for all our ideals, all vulnerable and all possibly about to be hurt. Stripped of physical imprisonment and violent reaction, anger is the purest form of care. The internal living flame of anger always illuminates what we belong to, what we wish to protect, and what we are willing to hazard ourselves for. That's what I'd like us to contemplate, this idea of anger as the deepest form of compassion and the illuminating possibility of what anger can bring us. So we'll sit for a half hour. I'm gonna turn off my video and my mute so that I can uh, go and help my granddaughter get herself together.
Do you consider this possible? Anger is the deepest form of compassion for another, for the world, for the self, for a life, for the body, for a family, and for all our ideals, for all vulnerable and all possibly about to be hurt. Stripped of physical imprisonment and violent reaction, anger is the purest form of care. The internal living flame of anger always illuminates what we belong to, what we wish to protect, and what we are willing to hazard ourselves for. If I were going to categorize my practice, I would say it is a, it has been over the 30 years that I've been practicing a love affair with anger. It's like, uh, I have been in relationship with anger my entire higher life. I grew up in a family full of it. My father was a rageaholic and my mother was this passive aggressive queen. I swear she could charm the devil and she's about to stab him in the back. She had a way of sounding really nice and sounding very sweet. But when my mother was angry, you are going to pay for it. It was the same with my father. So I kind of grew up in a world where anger was pretty normal. We just didn't, we didn't talk about it. And whoever was the angriest got their way. And so, no sense me pretending. I didn't grow up with the same mess. I had the same way about me. I was passive aggressive when that would work, and I was outwardly intimidating when that worked. Whatever worked, as long as I was getting my way, I was good with that. And I never had a problem with it. And then being a Black woman, of course, I had all kinds of self-righteous anger for all kinds of things that happened over the years from being in the military to even going to law school and being a prosecutor. I just always had the right to be angry. And everything about practice became consumed with anger. So when I first started practicing, even on my own, I came to this, um, I think I came to a wall. So I started my spiritual practice in the black church and there's a lot of anger in the black church and it's justified anger. And it's, it's, it, it was always like a, a, a way to, to, to move us uh, into create courage, I would say. But when I came to Dhamma, all of a sudden, everything slowed down to a crawl. 
everything just got quiet and still. And I, and that anger is big and loud. And so I naturally, I think, thought, oh, it's the anger that's the problem. If I get rid of that, then I'll be quiet and still like everybody else. I'll be, you know, good practitioner. So most of my practice, I'd say for the first 15, 16 years was, how do I not be angry? Okay, no more anger, gotta let that go because that's the evil part. And of course, I always associated anger with greed, hatred, and delusion. So hatred is anger. If I get rid of the hatred, I'm gonna get rid of the anger and all that's gone, everything's good. It wasn't until my brother, my nephew, died he got he was young 17 and he died in a shooting accident where he was a bystander and the level of rage that i had towards the shooter was palpable and it was so bad that i couldn't prevent myself from losing it at work so uh administrative person could do something I didn't like it and I would rage on them or some defense attorney would do something and I didn't like it. I'd rage on them. And I began to realize, Jesus, I, I cannot control this rage anymore. I can't control the level of rage that I was having. And so I went to my teacher to ask him, how do I control this rage? It's gotten out of hand. I can't control it anymore. How do I control it? And he said, oh, well, the rage is not a problem. You should look at your irritations. I'm like, well, will that control the anger and the rage? He's like, I said that rage and anger is not the problem. You should look at your frustrations. I'm thinking, Rodney, I love him to death, but He's a white man. He don't really understand what I'm talking about. So I'm trying to change the way I talk to him in a way that I think I should talk to a white man so that he understands this rage is about to land me in lockup. So what do I, how do I need to convey it to him? And finally, he tells me, he says, Tori, by the time you're in anger and rage, you're already out the gate. You've already left. And so then it's just a matter of managing that and keeping from hurting anybody. If you want to work on anger, you got to work on it before you leave the gate. And the only way to work on that is with irritation and frustration. I said, I don't get irritated. He goes, yes, you do but you don't see it. And so I started looking for irritation, frustration. I'm telling you right now, I cannot believe that I was pretty much irritated with everything all the time. I was rarely satisfied with life or anything. I judged anything. If I, if the pot sitting on the stove tipped over just a little or you know better yet if i'm stirring the sauce in the pot on the stove and a little sauce would slip out i'm irritated upset with the pot and the sauce it just i couldn't believe how much irritation and frustration i had but it was only because i started looking at it and then i started practicing with anger and I begin to understand some things about it. So that's what I wanna talk about because my understanding of anger is vastly different than the yogi that came into this practice with it. And sometimes I think my understanding was because of either a misunderstanding of teachers or the way we talk about anger. We talk about it like somehow or another, anger, is a problem.
but I want to see if I can talk about it a little differently and just give you some ideas to begin to spark your attention around it. I think one thing about anger is to begin to recognize that the energy of anger is expandable. It expands. It's not like a lot of other emotions, but it expands. And when it, it's, I think it expands because it's so big. So that energy can expand and expand and expand. And if we don't kind of grab it, what uh, Rodney was pointing to, we will miss the expanding nature of it. And when we miss the expanding nature of it, we get trapped in a much larger energy than maybe what we can manage. So part of our understanding with anger is learning how to keep anger within the context of anger and not in the expanded understanding of aversion or that uh, hatred. I like hatred better way, but aversion is softer. But if we keep anger within the context of its natural emotion, that arises in the course of life that we can manage. I think that's what Rodney called irritation or frustration, but I still call that anger. It's the expanded nature of anger that we have to be most careful about. The second thing about anger that is a little bit more, uh, um, the part of anger that uh, we have to worry about in this expanded nature is because anger trips up our natural tendency towards unwholesome roots. Again, this is the uh, uh, hatred, greed, hatred, and delusion itself, all of it though, because much of our anger, when it gets expanded and it trips up into our underlying tendencies towards greed, hatred, and delusion, our greed alone will force us into anger. Um, or our, I should say, our anger will force us into greed. And we can get trapped in the greed, hatred, and delusion. And then the third part about anger that we have to be mindful of is that anger is very subtle because I think it's subtle because we live in a culture that will not accept anger. And because we live in a culture, I mean, we live in a culture that, I don't know why I keep messing up my words, we live in a culture that accepts anger, but will not accept sadness, will not accept uh, hurt. It will not accept um, um, the crying part of, of uh, unpleasant emotions. So we live in a culture where we can get angry, but we can't be sad. We can get angry, but we can't be hurt. So even when my nephew got shot, I it was more understandable that I was mad and it was not understandable that I was sad or hurt. It's like a, somehow um, sadness is allowed for a short window of time and then we have to move on. Let's get it together. And so instead, we get angry and we're the champions and the people out there doing the, the, the suffering work, doing all that hard work. But I think if we begin to understand anger itself, we can begin to have an intimate relationship with it. And then we can, uh, I don't wanna use the word manage it like I used to, 
because it's like anger management. No. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of my niece. She has serious problems with anger. So whenever she loses it on someone, she will say, you know, I need, you know, I have anger management. And I say, no, you need anger management. She's like, no, I have anger management. You know, I have that. I'm like, yeah, you need it. I don't want to do the whole anger management. That's like a self-help kind of thing. What I think is a more appropriate way to look at this is taming. It's taming of anger. If you could think of anger when it's loose, it's, it's like a, a pets that are unwieldy. It's like, a, it's like a energy that's just flowing all over the place. And when it's so powerful, that if we don't learn to tame that energy, our own anger, then that energy can be un, unwieldy. It will um, go wherever it wants to go. And then our ability to try to reel it back in uh, gets harder and harder. And I think that's why we have the outward aggression and the passive aggression. So I wanna give you uh, a couple of things to understand about anger before I tell you how I think we could tame it. First, uh, you cannot con or manipulate anger. It, 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 we can con and manipulate other people, but we can't con and manipulate our own anger. When it's present, uh, the more we try to pretend like it's not, the more it chips away at us, the more it expands and grows. It's basically smarter than you. Uh, it knows you better than you know yourself. And so um, it, it will uh, create a way in which you will eventually admit its presence. It's not about, uh, it has nothing to do with a situation or a person. Because if it were about a situation or a person, then everybody would be angry at that situation or everybody would be angry at that person. It's why we don't get along in politics. Because we see things and say, oh, clearly you can see that this is wrong. And then you come up against someone that says, that's not wrong at all. I think that's the way it should be. And there's all this kind of, what are you talking about? Because the anger is actually ours. It's not the situation and it's not the person. Um, when we begin to realize that it's not tucked in the situation or the person, then we can begin to tame and practice with our own anger at whatever level we need to practice with it. Another thing is, is that every time we win with anger, we increase the likelihood we are gonna argue again. So anger has a way of increasing itself because every time we win, we need to win again, and we need to win again, and we need to win again. And as soon as we come up against someone who doesn't follow the win, then we gotta push harder and win more. And uh, if we push harder and we win, yeah, that is not gonna be good for you because you are gonna have to win again. There's something about the nature of winning with arguments and anger that ends up expanding it, uh, creating that expandability. So it's more like a facade, I think of. Uh, the emotional aspect of anger is very powerful and it's very um, um, supportive to move us. I think anger, 
uh, is one of the few emotions like sexual energy that can move us on a dime if we actually were not so afraid of its power. But it can be a facade in that, like I say, it's one of those false energies that we can use. It can be our fallback energy when really we don't want to deal with the other ones that we don't like. Like I hate disappointment. I hate it with a passion. And so whenever I feel disappointment, I will go to anger quickly. And sometimes I have to learn to ask myself, are you angry or are you disappointed? What's really going on here? Because if you would just let yourself feel the disappointment, then the anger is not really, it's a facade. It's just a front that's put up, but it's not really there. So what I think we're trying to do as practitioners is not, I, 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 I did a whole weekend on uh, Nibbana and something that I, I found a sutta where the Buddha said that the point of practice, the destination was the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion. That's what it is. Destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion. And the path to do that is mindfulness. So paying attention to the subtle energies that lead us towards these uh, hidden tendencies, underlying tendencies, these basic human ways of being that have nothing to do with you or me, but it has to do with the fact that we're in a human body, the more we are willing to practice at the uprooting of this, the freer we get. Not whether you have anger or not. It doesn't matter whether you have anger. This is what Rodney was pointing to. It's our willingness to practice with the irritations, the don't likes, the unpleasantness, the pleasantness, the wanting, the not wanting, all of that. That is what's going to uh, support us in the long run. Um, so here, I'm going to see if I can share some of the, um, just for just a few minutes, some of the ways you could think of taming. It's my acronym. This is the acronym I used to help me connect with the understanding, having an intimate relationship with anger. So the first thing is translate. The T stands for translate. I had to translate anger into what was actually happening. Translate, um, uh, translate what was going on for me instead of just calling it anger and leaving it at that. And some ways that you could begin to translate anger, um, sort of this. One, you could think of anger as uh, suffering. Right? So there's a way in which anger is painful. And so learning to see painfulness as a translation for anger. So I guess I should say, you're not translating anger into something else. You're translating the something else into an understanding of anger. So what we call painfulness or suffering is usually some degree of anger. Anger that has moved over into aversion and we didn't notice it. It expanded into an aversion, a resistance, a not wanting, and we didn't notice that. That way to notice this as the aversion, the translation of it into, oh, this is anger, anger be an aversion, you translate. So when you start feeling some degree of pain or suffering, our go-to energy is to begin to see this is aversion. That's what this is. This is hatred. That's why I'm having, there's a not wanting here. This is uh, the greed, 
and the delusion a wanting and a not seeing it and you just use that as your go-to another way to see uh to begin to see anger is to listen to your judgments and translate that as anger when we judge people judge things we are actually in aversion to it and so beginning to translate that uh judgment evaluation that is our aversion um another way um is when we need to fix something that is another way of saying i don't like it like this and that you can translate into an anger the reason why i think we translate these little simple things into anger is because we are trying to tame that anger and not let it scoot over into aversion and expand into hatred so we tame it to me i begin to translate things like oh i need to fix that i would translate that as oh that's anger it did not feel like anger what it felt like helped me see was oh this is irritation this is frustration this is don't like and if i don't deal with that it will move over it will expand into aversion and rage simply because i won't get my way i just have something i don't like and i try to fix it but it doesn't fix i'm like oh oh i'm sorry okay let me fix it and maybe you didn't hear me maybe i should do a little tweaky get it fixed now we're okay right no it doesn't no it doesn't work and you can see how that little irritation starts to expand into aversion, into what we consider that hatred or the anger or rage. But I don't think that's anger. I think this is just aversion. That's what this is what I'm trying to translate it. We can call it anger if that will get you to look at it. Uh, you could translate anger when you start seeing harm in others. You could translate that. Uh, when you start seeing that your retaliation and your behavior is harming another, that's anger. That is, uh, um, that's the aversion aspect of it. Um, let's go to another one. The next one is avert, right? So you can translate things. The next one is averting. But I just don't think of this as averting anger as in avoiding. But another way to think of avert is a, is a different way. It's like beginning to understand that our conduct, my dislike, don't like, don't want if i don't pay attention to it the comma of my actions affect other people and i can begin to see if you look you can see the harm we cause in other people and that harm is not coming from uh i just want to be mean to people it's coming from an expanded aversion an expanded energy of just not getting your way is usually the only thing that's happening you just don't get your way and you're expanding that aversion to try to make it happen if you see the comma of your own behavior and see the harm in other people you can see it another way to avert not avoid but allowing anger to be a natural emotion, which is ephemeral, just like all emotion. It arises and it passes away. The thing that I think the reason why 
we don't get to we don't get close to anger is because we don't like the way it feels. It 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 usually comes in a burst of energy and intensity. And so we don't like that feeling. And instead we do something else. We our minds go somewhere else instead of in the aversion. Uh, oftentimes it can go into our reactivity. And if you don't translate that reactivity into uh, aversion, um, again, it just gets grow, it just grows. So two more and then uh, uh, I will take some questions a little bit here. So one other thing I found that you can maneuver through anger. So this tame, it's like translating it or averting, you know, the harm that can come from it, or you can maneuver through it, which is creating space around it. Um, you can create space within it so that you can actually explore it, which is the E. And in exploring it, you got to see where your choice lies in dealing with things that you have aversion around. You have a choice, even when we have aversion around things in life. But we have to learn to see what that choice is. Um, the biggest sort of uh the biggest gift i think rodney gave me when he helped me begin to see to to get me i think what he did was he took away my fear of anger i when i went in to see him i thought anger was a problem that i needed to fix and even when i left I wasn't really quite sure he knew what he was talking about. I still had that sense that you just don't know how angry I can get, that kind of energy. But I trusted him as a teacher. He was my teacher and I trusted him. And so I stopped, um, I stopped trying to get rid of the anger and I started trying to look for irritation look for the expandability look for the things that that anger was expanding into and i want to leave you with this uh example of when i saw what it was that i was dealing with so i i had my uh nephew and, and my niece and her husband my nephew staying here and he's a cook but he's one of those kind of cooks. I think it's because he's a man. I don't know personally, but uh, he goes in the kitchen and that means he's frying up chicken and making mashed potatoes and he's using every pot there is in the kitchen. And yes, when he gets done, that food is damn good. But the kitchen looks like all hell broke loose. And I guess that must be the women's work because he didn't do anything to clean the kitchen up. So he made this dinner one night and it was so good. I go to bed, next day I get up, go in the kitchen to make some tea and it is a mess. They did not clean up nothing. It looks like it did the night before. And he was just lying on the floor, looking at his phone everybody was gone except for him and he's lying on the floor looking at his phone chilling and i remember walking past him to go back to my room and i sat down on my bed and i began to feel this energy so i thought okay no i'm not i'm, I'm not i'm gonna lose it i'm not gonna do that right i'm not gonna do that anger so I get up again, I go in the kitchen and I just started cleaning up my own kitchen from his cooking. I'm cleaning, I'm gonna just clean it up myself. I, that's what I'm gonna do. I start cleaning it up. And I hear this voice 
that sounded some kind of demon, demon voice, just cussing my nephew out. It was such a low growl. It was like animalistic. And at first I thought, who's here besides him? Some, surely some guy is here because that's a low growl of a voice. No, that was me. That was me hearing me mad about him. And I scared myself. So I went in, I stopped and I went in my room. I laid on the bed and I'm like, okay, we're gonna have to just be with this anger. Just be with it. Not going to run from it. Okay. I'm angry. So at first I thought, I'm just angry. I'm laying on the bed. I'm going to be with anger. And I could feel this tension just boiling up in me and all this anger at him. Boiling, boiling, boiling. And it was so painful. So I thought, where is this painful coming from? I'm feeling myself and my body is turning in knots and it's just squeezing and squeezing. <laughs> it's so embarrassing because it was so painful. I was having tears falling down because it was so painful. And then this moment arose when I noticed that I was literally doing this. <laughs> I was literally twisting myself more and more and more. And I thought to myself, what if I just let go of that twist? <laughs> you know, just stop doing that. That's it. That's all I did was let go of twisting. And the whole body began to relax. And I remember this sense of realizing that. I didn't like what happened, but I never told him to go do them dishes. So I get up and I say, go to the door. And I'm like, you know, Gary, I want to make some tea. I need you to clean, do the dishes. He's like, oh, oh, okay, auntie, just a minute. You know, <laughs> he puts his phone down, he goes in there and he does the dishes. The whole process was so, unnerving to me because I had no idea. I, I never felt anger, right? It, as soon as it would come, it's so powerful. I would do whatever I could to get rid of it. And it can scare us to think I'm going to be with anger. So what Rodney's gift was, he taught me how to inch up on that anger. Start with the little small things, the little irritations the little things here. I got used to the unpleasantness of irritation and frustration. So in that moment, when I had that big rage, I had enough practice capacity to actually look at it. And I think it's probably one of the last times I've ever been that angry. I don't think I've ever been that angry anymore. I can't. Because every time I, the anger starts growing to a level that it's that big, I know I'm twisting my body. Nobody else is twisting it. I'm just generating all this pain and suffering in my own body. The thing that I'm pointing to is the knowing of wrong and harm. That's one thing. That's the knowing of wrong and harm that something needs to be done with. The aversion to wrong and harm, that's our practice. Because that aversion to wrong and harm does nothing. It's just our own minds twisting into knots. Because I have no amount of aversion changes the current situation. And the only way to see that is to practice with being with our irritations and getting to know anger as a felt sense experience and not some thing out there that we shouldn't get trapped in or we shouldn't get lost in or I shouldn't be angry or I'm not angry, I don't get angry. I mean, all of it 
all of our judgments around anger. That the place to be is to practice with that. So I have a little poem I want to leave this with and then we'll take some questions and see what um what comes up. Um Let's see, it's mosquito. What is it? It should be mosquito. Wait a minute. Where is my poem? Ah, there it is. Oh, it's the. All right, so. It's by a person named Teddy Macker. Mos the mosquito among the raindrops. And the poem says, the mosquito among the raindrops. It's equivalent to getting hit, says the scientist, by a falling school bus and hit every 20 seconds. And the mosquito lives. In fact, she doesn't even try to avoid the drops. No zigzagging, no ducking, no hiding under eaves. How does she do it? No resistance to the force. She hitches a ride on the blow, a stowaway, on that which brings her down. She becomes one with the drop, knowing to fly again, she must fall. In a way, that's what I think our practice is helping us do. Anger is probably one of the biggest energetic flows that expands into greed, hatred, and delusion. And if we're going to walk this path of liberation, we have to let go of greed, hatred, and delusion. And one of the best ways to see it is to begin to see our anger. And one of the best ways to see our anger is to begin to see our irritations, our frustrations, our don't likes. And gradually over time, we learn to tame this energy so that when we need to do something, you know, move and have enough energy to take on a big problem, we can do that without being swallowed up by our own rage. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We'll just sit here for a moment, just so we can let all the words kind of settle and keep what we like and get rid of what we don't like. All righty. Well, let's see if you have any comments or questions. The whole gamut. You like it, you don't like it. I'm pretty good with all of it. <laughs> but I think where we, the reason why we don't do that is because as, as practitioners, I don't think we want to admit how much we are irritated with life. I think we like to believe that I'm good, I'm good. Oh, I'm good, I'm good, I got that. Oh yes, everything's good, everything's beautiful, everything's peaceful and kind, I'm still, everything's wonderful. And so we ignore that that gauge is moving and expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. I think that's what Rodney was pointing to me. 
yeah. to that as practitioners, we got to see how much we resist or don't like in life. There is that, but there is something else that Rodney was pointing to that I began to realize. Because what you're describing in that example is, is changing the outer condition. So it's the outer condition that needs to be fixed and then I won't be angry. That is not true. She could put that cup wherever you want it put and I guarantee you, you're gonna be irritated with something else. You'll be like, oh honey, honey, maybe you could move this and then it's do this and then it's do that because the irritation is not coming from where she puts the cup. It's coming from our own internal I don't like that, therefore it needs to be fixed. And the practice is, I don't like that, what is the delusion I'm expecting in here? That's what I had to see uh, with that anger with my nephew. It's, it's, it wasn't, it is true that I told my nephew to go clean up, but the, the anger for me in that moment was I felt like I needed to go clean up the kitchen and I didn't need to clean up the kitchen. I just needed to speak it. In the situation with your cup, with the, with the wife, it seems like you actually need your wife to fix the cup, move the cup so you won't be angry. And I, I think that's just trying to create the outer conditions. I was free enough to speak to my uh, nephew because I was basically cracking up that I was twisting my body in a knot and didn't even know it was happening. I couldn't even believe it. It was not even necessary. So if you're right, if you're, if you're no longer twisting your body in the knot and then you tell your wife about the cup, then the telling her about the cup is not about your anger. Do you see what I'm saying? To, if, if, if telling her about the cup is to keep you from being angry, then it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Because even if she does do what you want, you'll have to face a, a different one. She, you'll just keep picking. It's like an itch when you're meditating. Don't scratch it. Because if you do, it's gonna be itching again here, and then there, and then over here. And then you, at some point you gotta stop scratching because it's not gonna stop itching until you stop. And that's, you see the difference between the two? The anger was already gone in me when I asked my nephew to do the, the kitchen. I could have went and did it myself and I wouldn't have been angry because it was already gone when I stopped twisting the body. Yeah, I think, I, I, I didn't uh, get to this, but the point that I wanted to ultimately make was that I think once I was no longer trapped in the anger, it's why I could open the door for Mudita and why I have so much joy all the time. Because I think anger is this notion that we have to have the world a certain way. We ha it has to be, there's a right way and a wrong way and it has to be this way. But that really isn't true. You actually can be with the world as ephemeral as it is without any problems if we learn to live in an ephemeral world. You learn to live with impermanence, you can be with it. So the problem is that as practitioners in the way we practice, we put an overemphasis on samadhi, I think. This is my, my thoughts. Like we need samadhi true enough. You need a level of stillness and, and uh, peace. But that stillness and peace is really designed to help you see greed, hatred, and delusion. That's what it's for. See, that's what the practice is about. So at some point, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. Black folks are going to have to come out of the affinity groups 
And white folks are going to have to be in the same space with some angry black folks. That's what Sims is used to be in space with angry black folks because I'm always talking about being black and being angry. So they're kind of used to it. And I can feel free to say, in fact, I think sometimes I talk so freely about what it means to be black in a Buddhist practice world and in the world at Sims that I go to other sanghas and they're a little taken back, like, oh, oh, I just can't help it. It's sort of like at this point in our lives as practitioners, we're gonna have to get over some of the, the issues we have between us as races. It's stupid anyway, we kind of know, everybody knows that it's made up and we still walk around holding it. So part of, Part of what I, I think is at some point when we get past the idea that practice is about samadhi, is about peacefulness, and we actually start talking about liberation, we are going to want to get out of those separate groups and we are going to want to rub up against each other because that's the only way you know, Greg, uh, Greg Kramer, who does that relationist practice with ID, he said, I asked him one time, what's the benefit of Sangha? How could I say what the benefit of Sangha was? And he goes, well, I just have one, one sentence. How would you know you were ang uh, arrogant unless someone else told you? And I thought about that, right? Who's going to know they're arrogant? I don't know I'm arrogant, I think I'm good. I'm, I'm glad, I, everything's good. Every, go my way, I'm smart, that's good. But if I take that arrogance and I put it in a room with somebody else, they are gonna let me know I'm arrogant. And at some point as practitioners, if we're gonna create a model that's sort of like the monastic model, which is we are a Sangha and we practice together as a Sangha, Monastics are put in a situation where they have to learn to get along with each other. But we practice in sanghas and then we create all these little silos so we don't really have to practice with each other. And that doesn't work. We will not awaken if we do that. The reason why I think the Buddha said that sangha was the whole of the practice is what um, Greg Kramer said. Because I don't know I'm arrogant unless I get in the room with somebody else and they tell me. And as soon as they tell me, I'm gonna be hurt. But if I'm practicing, I'm gonna learn to say, oh, I see. I see something that I couldn't see otherwise without you. So somehow I think people of color have to create a doorway that allows for, in some respects, until, uh, white sanghas are a little bit more competent. There has to be a doorway that allows people of color to come through a people of color sit and then in through the main uh, place so that there's a, there's, a, there's a level of safety. But I do think in people of color sit, we have to encourage that coming out. And, um, I hope that white people begin to learn that the sangha you're gonna have is not brown white people. It's, it's, it doesn't work like that. It's, you're gonna have a sangha that's not the sangha you had when it was all white people. It'll be different, probably a little bit noisier, a little bit rowdier, but it will not be the same sangha but your capacity for liberation will be greatly enhanced as soon as you get into a room with people not like you. So you can see things that you can't see in a room with people only like you. So that's what I think I would hold it out as. It's gonna be difficult, but I think, um, I think it's coming anyway. I think you can't have this many BIPOC teachers and you're not going to have uh, it's, it's definitely we're definitely going to change the way Dhamma is. I don't know how we're going to change it and what we're going to do, but I know 
the Dharma that is going to be existing in the U.S. over the next 10, 20 years will not be the Dhamma that came 20 years earlier. It will be vastly different. But I also think we have never been in a greater place to awaken because we've never been in a place where, you know, what we're doing in America and in Europe in this kind of inside tradition is quite different than the way that Dhamma was practiced. Because on one hand, we are meditating together as a Sangha, but we're not monastics. And we live as householders, so we're out in the world. And the potential for awakening, that awakening energy to expand out into all kinds of ways, it is, it is huge in the U.S. in the way that we practice Dhamma. It's, it's never been like this. Even in Asian countries, as deep as people practice, their practice was personal. And somehow we practice as if it's outward. And before, I think that's what we did. We practiced like it was personal. But I don't think that personal practice is going to work so much anymore. I think what we're going to see is that practice is going to get more and more and more and more and more and more um communal not communal meaning our little sangha but i mean communal meaning the whole country the whole the issue itself and that is a very different thing but i would love i'm just grateful to be a part of it because i think we're going to have some we're going to see some, i don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime but you know, I got a few more lifetimes to come back anyway, so I'll just see the remnants of it later on. <laughs> All right, good peoples. Well, you know, I love coming and talking with you. I love talking with you. I think common ground does big things. I know it's probably you have your ebbs and flows and your things that work and things that don't work and you're not all part of common ground, but there's just something about uh, the idea that you have a vigil in this way that you do and that we come together and talk really warms my heart. And so um, I hope you translate that into um, something tangible for your Sangha and for the people around you. So I think this is what I think Rodney was pointing to me, so I'm going to point to you the same way. Don't worry about that moment. If you're going to practice with anger, worry about the little frustrations that are going on around you. Because when you practice with the little frustrations and you get used to the felt sense of unpleasantness, you will be able to practice in these bigger contexts. But if you try to take on the bigger context, then you will... Uh, it, you'll fold under the pressure of it because it's very, very difficult. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think that the point of practice is to begin to see where you are holding a distortion. So if you're feeling someone else's anger, that distortion could be that you're taking it personal. It's not personal, that's their anger. So you have to let go of the personal or you're thinking this is permanent, this is the way it's gonna be now and really it's just a moment that's flowing through. So if you let go of that sense that this is permanent, then you can let their anger just be there, be big and just keep on flowing. Or it's, I think one of the main reasons why people get trapped in other people's anger is because we expect the world to be lovely and it's not always lovely. So we want people to be happy, everything's great, it was good. And then when you see anger, we get trapped in it. So you have to let go of the notion that the world's gonna be lovely. It's not lovely. People are gonna be angry. That's, it doesn't mean anything. You don't have to fix their anger. This is just the nature of it. And then the third one is this idea that things should satisfy us that don't, the fourth one, things should satisfy us and they don't. And that, that 
the things that should satisfy us and they don't is sometimes we expect that uh, people, places, things are going to be a certain way. And when we get around it, it's not. So I expect my friend to be, I'm going to go see my friend. We're going to hang out. Then I get over there and they're all upset, mad, angry. It's not good at all. And we then get mad, like me getting mad at the sauce because it's it flipped out of the pot as if somehow or another that means something. But really, it's just, oh, I today is just not a good day. So we're going to have to work with it. Either you stay and be with the angry friend, and they probably will love you if you just stay and be with the angry friend and don't try to make them not angry. Like, okay. Or you say, I can't, I don't have the bandwidth to be with the angry friend and I got to go. But instead, what we do is we pretend like that's not happening and, and instead be in the expectation that it should be like this. And then that creates more anger in us too. Do you see? So what you're really doing is just learning how to let go of your own distortion so that you're not trapped in the anger. The anger is not the problem. It's usually the distortion that's pushing it. That's the problem. All right, good peoples. Well, I see it's our time has ended. So um, I really, you know, uh, we have to work on anger because we are living in a world that is the dark ages. All right, so let's just be clear. Uh, we are living in the dark ages. Let's don't pretend anymore. We don't live in the Renaissance times. Uh, we live in the dark ages and the inquest uh, Inquisition is all around us, so no sense playing about that. I read this little quote that said, how come we were taught to fear the witches and not the people willing to burn them alive? And we got to think on that, right? How come <laughs> we feared the witches, not the people who burned them alive? That is what I think anger does. We can get caught in anger and get angry at all the little, this ain't right, and that, oh, and this and that, and all the little uh, pokey things that the peoples that be, the powers that be, keep us stirred up in so we won't ever turn as a 99 percenter and look at them. So I think it's about time we get together as the 99 percenters and start turning and looking at the, the people doing the burning of the witches alive. That's what we need to look at. <laughs> we need to stop looking at them witches because they ain't doing nothing, but you know, they like plants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's where, hey. that's where, that's where we're going to stay together with. All right. Stacy. Yes, ma'am. I, I feel inspired to give a little uh, uh, Donna talk. Right, <laughs> you. Okay, you give a Donna talk. May I? Yes, you may. Absolutely. <laughs> real, real, real quick. Okay. You know, so um, first I want to say how much I appreciate where you um, coming back, giving this talk, the preparation that you put into this talk going outside of the conventional Dhamma resources <laughs> to address anger in a way that's not addressed in the suttas, to break it down, to make it memorable um, and, and practical so that we can not be afraid of ourselves, the natural parts of ourselves, and also not be afraid of each other <laughs> because we all experience anger, to normalize it. As I was listening to you all, was, uh, I was also looking at Jean. I was looking at Angela <laughs> and the fact that we um, all kind of came up in a community Dharma leader training together and appreciating that. And also thinking about what you said in terms of communal liberation, that each one of us, our presence uh, tonight contributed to your talk. You fed off of us, we fed off of you. And it um, all came together for this beautiful and inspiring and real talk. So 
Um, Very nice. Yeah, so I ask that we all support Tuere, who um, really, I mean, she pr probably told you this, but I'll, I'll tell you again, who gave up um, the practice of law. I did. I mm -hmm. don't know if I've ever told people. Yeah, I oh, did. Yeah. Who gave up the practice of law to dedicate um, her life to teaching the Dhamma. And we get to benefit from that, um, from that choice you made. So thank you. Let's thank support. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was so nice. I, oh, I just, uh, yeah, we all came together. Sometimes when I see Jean, I, oh, I would see as uh, Angela, I remember we, we were so fortunate to be in a group of people that created a whole bunch of anger and then stayed together. That first retreat, we didn't think we were coming back and everybody came back. So, and we worked through that anger. So that's what, that's what Sangha is about. That's good. All right, peoples, I'll see you again. I'm sure I'll be back and see you again and we'll see you then. Thank you so much for your continued practice and all your support. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone.